Hello! <clears throat> Today we are going to be covering Chapter 3, Identifying an Issue in Humanities 140, Critical Thinking in the Modern Age. So let's talk about one of the biggest issues we see is the in inability to speak clearly. And what we call this in the United States is talking in circles. And this means to talk in a confusing or roundabout manner. It can also mean to repeat a point multiple times, saying little or nothing new and just changing the words without providing new information or thoughts. Usually people will talk in circles when they are hiding something, lying, or when they are trying to disparage or confuse you. They also talk in circles if they don't have any idea what they're talking about, so they create a very murky environment for communication, and as a consequence, no information is understood or transferred or um, has any ability to figure it out, so to speak. So one of the things that we want to look at is how to clear this fog of confusion. And we're going to look at advertising because that's one of the most uh, obvious examples of this. So often a person who is trying to sway your opinion, in other words persuade you, will communicate in a confusing way in order to make the issue less clear. So in this picture that is a Samsung ad, it is a woman dressed in a kind of gold looking dress and she's sitting against an onion and very small in the right hand bottom corner is a computer screen but if you compare that computer screen to the size of the onion it's much much bigger so you know is, a, is Samsung getting into the business of selling onions well clearly we're not quite sure what they're selling. Um, the verbiage at the bottom of the screen um, is hard to read because of its script and it's also very small but essentially it says even in soap opera um, looks even a soap opera looks like a work of art and again that was tough to read and what we see here is an image it captures our eye. Gold is a color that captures our eyes. We have our golden dream. We have the gold at the end of the rainbow. Gold has a very positive connotation and because of that we want to stare at this golden image and if you look at the background and even the shadows they are done in shadows of gold. Now these two ads, which are particularly bizarre, are both for car companies and really the only way you can tell is in the bottom right corner of each advertisement. There is Nissan at the top and Honda at the bottom. So what we see in the top picture is a road that stretches. There's no beginning, there's no end, but there are chickens who are digging holes to go under the road. So you could kind of go in the direction of, you know, why did the chicken cross the road? Well, there's no real answer to that, but we now know that chickens have the ability to use a shovel despite their wings as opposed to arms and that they can avoid getting hit by a car because we always see chickens crossing the roads in the wilds of Arizona. Down below on the right hand bottom side you're going to see a man who is um, appears to be Middle Eastern and we get another clue with the camels in the background and then um, he appears to be pointing in a particular direction but he has the world's longest arm that is very circuitous and it's pointing due west. Now what does that mean? Not really sure. We do see a tire in the background on the left side, so you know we have some sort of reference to vehicles. Uh, and again, you know, it catches our eyes, and that's really what the advertisers want us to do: is to look at their ad. We are inundated 
with thousands of advertisements a day on the internet, on billboards as we drive, in magazines, TV, even radio commercials, audio. And the point that a lot of advertisers are trying to do, what they're trying to do is get us to pay attention. And if we don't exactly remember the product, we at, la at least remember the ad. Politicians also rely on confusion. Um, it's pretty much the standard operating procedure for politicians these days. So uh, this is a picture of Rick Santorum, former Pennsylvania senator and a 2016 presidential candidate who claims that the number of scientists who believe in climate change, which is 97%, was pulled out of thin air. The study he refers to is not named, so we don't know who did the study. And so when Torum says it was a survey of 77 scientists, not even 97 scientists, which kind of makes us question whether or not he understands math and how to create percentages. But then he also says, let's talk about facts. And the fact is, lots of things can cause climate change, which in fact is true. But the scientists overwhelmingly say that since the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s, global warming has increased at an unparalleled in history rate. And if you look on the right hand side, we have the real story, which is that several surveys involving thousands of researchers have all found that the level of consensus is about 97% based on these studies. And these are only three studies. I could literally put a dozen different studies on here to uh, demonstrate the consensus by the vast majority of scientists. So the first bullet, 3,146 Earth scientists were surveyed in 2009 by the American Geophysical Union's EOS magazine. Then we had 908 researchers surveyed by the National Academy of Sciences in 2010. And then more recently in 2013, the Environmental Research Letters Journal looked at 11,944 science articles about climate change. So by looking at just these numbers that I pulled off of factcheck.org, which is a fantastic site and I recommend that you start using it on a regular basis, we already are seeing almost 15,000 scientists, not 77 or even 97, 15,000 scientists. And if we looked at the aggregate of all of the scientific studies, it would be triple or quadruple that. Another um, misleading advertisement which was all over the TV a few years ago was by the Conservative Political Action Committee Crossroads GPS which exaggerated the earnings of unionized government workers in a TV ad attacking unions and Democrats especially President Obama the ad claimed that government workers who belong to unions are paid 42 percent more than non-union workers but the study cited by the ad says the gap is only 10 percent once geographic differences are accounted for so what you see on the right hand side is what the Cato Institute study which is cited on the ad uh, actually says and it says part of this union non-union pay difference stems from general labor market variations across states states with generally higher wages tend to be more unionized analyses that account for cross-state differences find that public sector unions increase average pay levels by roughly 10 percent so rather than 42 percent as demonstrated in this advertisement it's actually closer to 10 percent and when they say cross-state differences I want you to think about how much somebody who is working as a um, accountant, for example, would make in Indiana versus California or New York. Of course, these 
California and New York states, people generally have a higher standard of living. They make more money, but things also cost a heck of a lot more. So, you know, the price differentials are also passed along in terms of cost of items and services. Um, but when we look at the actual study, we're only seeing that 10% increase, which basically means that union employees tend to make about 10% more than their non-union com compatriots. Now, why would a conservative political action committee be putting out a, an ad that is so misleading? Well, the bottom line is that the vast majority of people who donate to this political action committee are part of the so-called 1% who make a ton of money and want to keep salaries for their employees as low as possible. So it's in their best interest and there's nothing wrong with that. But we as consumers of this information need to look further than what they're throwing at us. Now we're going to look at some questions that will help clear up the fog of confusion. First we have what are called descriptive issues or questions, which basically means we're asking what happened. Predictive issues, as suggested by the word predict, means what will happen. And prescriptive is what should happen. And here's an easy way to think about it. You just found out that your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever love muffin you have may be cheating on you. They got a text message that you saw or some girl was inappropriate with your boyfriend. So predictively, what will happen? Well, depending on the person, you may say, you know what, I trust them. I'm not going to even think about it. Other people will say, you know what, I don't want to know. So you don't do anything. Now the prescriptive issue is what you should do, which maybe is to confront your love muffin and say, what the heck. So predictive means what do you think will actually happen? And prescriptive is what do you think should happen? Now, here are examples of the differences in a healthcare setting between descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. So, descriptive, we're just going to look at the first line, or first question under each. How many patients did we care for last month? In other words, what was our population in the hospital in the month of July or August? What will happen is we're looking at how many hip replacement surgeries are we likely to perform next month. So if we're trying to figure out how many patients we're going to have, we have to predict based on former information. Now, the prescriptive is you need five extra nurses next Sunday night to handle the ER, meaning we're going to say we're going to have an increase in the number of patients so we need five extra. So we're predicting extra patients so we're prescribing more nurses. And then as you can look down you'll see there's a variety of different um, uh, other descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive ideas on this slide. So to go a little bit in more depth, uh, descriptive issues or questions raise questions about the accuracy of descriptions in the past, present, and future. So some examples would be which diet is the most effective for losing weight. So let's say you talk to a friend who's lost a ton of weight and you say which one was the most effective. And she's going to or he's going to say, well, I did this and this and this. None of them worked, but then I tried this and it was fabulous. Uh, another example, do couples who have separate friends argue less with one another? And again, you know, we ask our friends, what do you think? You know, should I let my boyfriend go to the football game with his buddies and stay home? So, you know, we're describing the situation and we're looking for an answer. And then another example, of course, is what is the best way to treat diabetes? 
predictive questions are um, require us to combine the information available today and information from the past to forecast how situations should be handled. Should I buy a house because interest rates should be staying low? Or, you know, should I get a bigger car because gas prices are expected to keep dropping? And these are these predictions, you know, I'm going to make a choice, but it's based on another situation. Finally, with prescriptive questions, what we see are questions about what we should do and what is right or wrong, good or bad. And oftentimes we see these as social problems in society. Some of the ones that we see on a regular basis, they are things like, should we teach sex ed in middle school? You know, uh, prescriptive being, you know, our kids having sexual activity prior to high school and do we need to intervene and make sure they are aware of the risks. Um, ought we send animal abusers to jail and must we legalize drugs to reduce government spending on prisons. Prescriptive questions tend to be those questions that are about the future and again usually we see them with social issues um, on a regular basis. So sometimes the hard part is determining what the issue is. And when it's phrased as a question, it's fairly obvious. We can see what the issue is. However, often the issue is not so clear. And in this case, we have to ask questions to find clues. What is the author reacting to? What is the author's background and who are they affiliated with? And this is significantly important. On the right hand side you see two female newscasters. The blonde on the top is Ann Coulter. She is a conservative uh, commentator for Fox News and she basically toes the party line, you know, advocating conservative values at every stop. On below her is Rachel Maddow who is a news commentator for MSNBC which is a very liberal or progressive um, news channel and she has a very liberal or progressive perspective so you know that she and Ann Coulter are pretty much going to disagree on everything um, so it's important to understand who the people are that are saying these things uh, years ago, the doctor who put out a study implying that there might be a connection between autism and vaccination was actually um, in cahoots with a law firm that was going to underwrite a law case, um, a court case, against the manufacturers of vaccinations. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize that Andrew Wakefield, this is the doctor who wrote this study, um, you know, he just wasn't wrong. He was immorally wrong. He was putting out information that would have eventually um, made him a lot of money. Uh, find the conclusion of the author's point and this should reveal the issue. Again, sometimes you just need to read the introduction and the conclusion to get what the issue is about. So then we look at perceiving the issue. And the important thing to take away from this conversation is that perception is shaped by the sum of our experiences. So who you are who your parents are, who your siblings are, where you grew up, what kind of socioeconomic status your family had, if you grew up in the city or the town or in the country, whether you grew up in the United States or another country, all of these define the filter by which you look at the world. And this perception that is filtered through your experiences becomes your reality. People who do not have ha who have not had your experiences may not agree with you or see your point of view. So you have to look at the fact that every single person you meet has had a different life experience 
including your siblings because once they get out of the house their experiences are going to be different than yours um, has a filter in which they interpret the information around them now there's a term called naive realism and this is the fact that humans often believe that the world is the way they perceive it meaning my way or the highway so for example the woman down in Kentucky who was trying to prevent gay couples from getting married because of her religious affiliation sees the world with this naive realism she sees the fact that she's been saved by Jesus and that what these gay couples are doing is inherently immoral and she cannot allow this to go on well the fact of the matter is that if a grocery store clerk was Muslim and Muslims don't eat pork they can't tell their boss that they're not going to serve any pork um, same thing with a Christian scientist if you're Christian if a doctor converts to Christian scientist and they don't believe in cutting the body open he can't go around telling people that they shouldn't have surgery so this naive realism is pretty endemic in the United States especially but it's important to be a good critical thinker and realize that not everyone is going to agree with your perception now the basic formula for people who really like math of finding a conclusion is to recognize that arguments have a structure and that structure is this because of that this is the conclusion that are the reasons or supports why we should believe this conclusions are often inferred or derived using logic and reasoning and this is not necessarily a bad thing you know um, if you are arguing about you having uniforms in school you know I believe in uniforms in school because it levels the playing field in an economic way that is a conclusion based on this information now a claim without support is an opinion and this is what we see over and over and over again and you oftentimes hear people say well I don't know but that's my opinion just because it's their opinion doesn't make it true doesn't make it real and it doesn't make it a fact so if somebody says to you well I believe that uh, people who come from Botswana are terrible people and you say to them well how many people from Botswana have you met and they say no none but that's just my opinion well that doesn't make it real and again what we have to say is and as critical thinkers sometimes it is an awkward moment when you have these conversations like sure it's your opinion but do you have any facts it's ridiculous so here's an example finding the issue using the conclusion world hunger would be reduced if more people ate insects as a part of their diets fewer people would go hungry more people would get the vitamins minerals and micronutrients they need to live healthy lifestyles and our planet would be relieved of the burden of unsustainable food system so you know this is a perfect way to end a essay about using bugs as a dietary option so the issue is really in that first sentence you know we could help alleviate world hunger if people ate you know crickets and ants and all those disgusting little creepy crawlies in some parts of the world and for example in parts of Asia eating bugs is pretty much a standard part of their diet especially things like crickets um, whereas in a country like the United States you know we smack them with our shoe but we wouldn't scrape them up and put them on our toast otherwise other ways to identify an issue when you're reading is to look at the title search out the opening paragraph seek out indicator words and phrases such as consequently therefore it follows that shows that indicates that suggests that thus the point being made 
proves that and the truth of the matter is so these are rhetorical clues for the reader or listener to identify what the person is actually talking about and it is way simpler than you know it sounds simple but sometimes with reading assignments you can get bogged down in vocabulary you can get bogged down in terminology that you don't understand and you can get bogged down in just the way that things are written finally we're going to talk about writing about an issue and this is going to be super important in your English classes and probably history if you take a history class the most important thing to realize is that you need to explain and back up your point of view. Do not assume people understand why you think a certain way. So if you have a particular perspective that, for example, your favorite singer in the entire universe forever and ever is, is Kanye West, and people might say, why? And you say, well, I just that's my opinion again you know that's not giving people any backup or explanation you could talk about his ability to produce music contribute to other artists rap um, how he has you know turned his brand of being an obnoxious guy into a pretty popular social experiment information that supports your point of view builds a case to prove your perspective on an issue and the data you use needs to be valid and reliable and you know part of this is if you know you're right you need to make sure that you have the information to back up that you are right if on the other hand you don't really get what you're doing and you don't have the information you're gonna sound like an idiot eventually because you are going to come across somebody who does have that information who has valid and reliable data and you want to be able to put forth your perspective with a valid reasoning anyway that does it for today's lecture if you have any questions please feel free to text or email me and I hope you have a fantastic day thank you